Nagara Gokula Ranjana Kana Jasomati Nandana Prajabarana Kara Gokula Ranjana Kana Gopi Parana Dhana Madhana Manohara Gopi Parana Dhana Madhana Manohara Kalyadamana Vidhana Kaliya Dhamana Vidhana Amala Harina Mamiya Vilasa Amala Harina Mamiya Vilasa Vipina Purandara Navina Nagarabara Vamsi Vajana Suvacha Vipina Purandara Navina Nagarabara Vam Sivatana Suvasa Raja Janapalana Surakula Nashana Raja Janapalana Surakula Nashana Nanda Kodana Rakoala Nanda Kodana Rakoala Govinda Madhava Navanita Tashkara Govinda Madhava Navanita Tashkara Sundarananda Gopala Sundarananda Gopahala Yamuna Tata Chara Gopi Vasanahara Yamuna Tata Chara Gopi Vasanahara Rasa Rasika Kripa Mahaya Rasa Rasika Kripa Mahaya Shri Radha Pallava Vrindavananata Parah 
Radha Bala Bhavrinda Vananaka Bara Bhakati Vinoda Shraha Bhakati Vinoda Shraha Amala Harina Mami Avilasa Amala Harina Mami Avilasa Govinda Madhava Navanita Taskara Govinda Madhava Navanita Taskara Shri Radha Balava Vrindavana Natabara Shri Radha Balava Vrindavana Natabara Bhakati Vinoda Shraya Bhakati Vinoda Shraya Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare 
राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओम विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण प्रेस्ताय भूतले श्रीमती भक्ति वेदांत स्वामीन इति नामने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पश्चाचारिणे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वसुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाया So in the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada explains Bhagavad Gita is comprising five topics. There is first of all Ishwara, the Supreme Controller. We all have to recognize that everywhere there is some controller. We are not so free that we can just move as we like without being controlled. So there are different controllers. You go into an office, someone's in charge. They'll ask you, what do you want? Why have you come here? You go into the shop, people will also approach you. Yes, what do you want? And in every home, there's a controller, right? Every house, someone's in charge. And similarly, in the country, there's a controller, there's a government, and there's the head of the government. And then, on a universal scale, there, is all, there are also controllers. Just as we speak about demigods or devatas, that there are personalities who are in charge of the different phenomena of the material world. Just as Lord Indra is in charge of the rain, Vayu is the god of wind, Surya the sun god. Like this there are 33 crore or 330 million devatas. There are so many different aspects to the material world. So there are different personalities given charge. Just like death. There is the god of death who we call Yamaraj. And Yamaraj is the, we say the god who punishes the sinful people. So, these are positions, they're given to some living entity, they're awarded, just like somebody becomes a, in charge of the government, it's not their position eternally, but for some time they have that position. And the same way, on, in the universal scale, when we look at the devatas, the demigods, 
they're also just in charge for some time. It may be for the duration of the universe. But the duration of the universe is also not eternal because this universe is material. It is created, it's maintained for some time, and then it's annihilated. There's a destruction. And there are personalities also in charge of that. Lord Brahma is generally considered to be the creator. Lord Vishnu is the maintainer and Lord Shiva is the annihilator. So you see there are many different personalities who are controlling different features of the world. But above all of them, there is one supreme controller. Or we could say the Param Ishwara. There are many Ishwaras, but there's only one Param Ishwara, one Supreme Controller. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada writes in his preface that the concept of Ishwara is vague, that there are many controllers, many different personalities in control. But there's only one absolute truth. So he prefers the concept of the absolute truth rather than the Ishwara. We think of the, the absolute truth, that truth which is above everything. There, there is relative truth, but there is also absolute truth. Relative truth is true today, may be true tomorrow, may not. It may be true to me, it may not be true to you. It's relative. But the absolute truth is something which is accepted by everyone, everywhere, for all time. So the concept of the absolute truth or we could say the param satyam, param satyam, satyam meaning truth and param the supreme truth. So Srimad Bhagavatam says param satyam dimahi, that I meditate upon that absolute truth. We also want to fix our minds on the absolute truth. There is one absolute truth and the, that absolute truth is personal that it is not just something abstract but there's a personality who is the absolute truth so Bhagavad Gita is explaining to us first of all about Ishwara and then the Jiva the living entities, just like all of us are living entities. We are all individuals. We each have our own name, we each have our own identity. Not only are we individuals, but all living entities are individuals. Just as we are spiritual beings, other living entities are also spiritual. The Vedas tell us there are 8,400,000 different species of life. And from the 8,400,000 species of life, only 400,000 are human species. So we see on this planet there are different human species. We see there are Chinese, there are African, there are Caucasian, there, oh, there are many different species of human beings. And so the Vedas tell us there are actually 400,000 different species. 
just like here in Malaysia, we have also, we have the people who live in the mountains, you know, the or original inhabitants of Malaysia, the tribal people are like Aborigines and they're there and similarly in Australia there were there's also the original inhabitants of Australia now of course so many other people have come there in South America they killed all the original inhabitants. Everyone was just killed when they invade, when the Spanish and Portuguese invaded there. They just killed everyone. No one survived. But now, of course, South America is full up with many other people. So many others came there. So there are human beings of different races. But there are also other living entities in different bodies, in plant bodies, in animal bodies, in the bodies of birds and fish, different species of life, insects. They're, they, they're all individual living entities and they each have souls. They're also living entities with a spirit soul. In our past, we have also taken different bodies. Now we have a human body, but we have had many births in many different places in different species of life. Now we have this human body. The human body is especially important because in the human form of life we have the opportunity to inquire about the purpose of our existence. To ask questions like, who am I, why am I here and where am I going? What's going to happen to me? When I die, for example, where will I go? What happens? And where did I come from? Why am, why am I in this body? So, human life is meant for this kind of inquiry. Other forms of life, they cannot inquire like that. They don't have the intelligence which the human beings have. They do have intelligence, but it's very limited. Just like dogs have some intelligence. You can, you can uh, see the intelligence of the dog. When they come for food, you can get the dog to sit on its hind legs and put its front paws up and you can get the dog to do tricks to please you. You can throw the ball, the dog will run and get the ball and bring the ball back. In this way, the, the dogs, they have some intelligence. Little birds will come and they can eat food. They will know there's some rice. Sometimes the birds, they will come to take our tosi leaves. The birds like very much the leaves from the Tausi tree. And if you're trying to grow Tausi, sometimes you have to be careful because the birds come and they like very much the leaves from the Tausi. It's very tasty for them. They won't eat other leaves so well, but they like Tausi. So they have intelligence. But their intelligence is very limited. We, will, we speak about the animal propensities, the propensities in the animal form of life. Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki Jai. So the animals, 
they are only engaged in four activities, eating and sleeping and mating and defending. That is animal life, to only eat and sleep and mate and defend. Human life is meant for something more than just only these four activities. Of course, we also eat, but we don't just live to eat. We eat to live. There's a difference, right? We eat to live. We don't live to eat. You live to eat. You eat a lot, right? You, you just want to eat and eat and eat. But we eat to live. In other words, we don't eat too much. We just eat what's necessary. That is sense control. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna speaks about this. He said, a yogi does not eat too much and does not eat too little. If he eats too much, then you get diabetes easily. You can become diabetic. The Prabhupada said it's a rich man's disease. <laughs> the rich men, they, will, they eat too much sometimes and, and no exercise. So they can easily get that kind of help. And you eat too little, then you get tuberculosis. You didn't eat enough, you could easily get TB, tuberculosis. So you have to be careful. We have to be careful. The animals, they're regulated in these things. Human life, we're given more freedom. It's, we're left to use our intelligence. The, the birds, they don't usually get overweight. They don't usually eat too much and stuff. You know, the birds and similarly dogs. Well, sometimes you see dogs, you know, people give the dogs too much, the dogs get overweight, then they have to take the dog for exercise. <laughs> so human beings, we have to be careful. Don't eat too much, don't eat too little. And sleeping also. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. How much to sleep? Srila Prabhupada recommends, he said, six hours should be probably enough. If you get six hours in the night, that's a good amount of sleep. I don't know. Before becoming a devotee, maybe you didn't even, you didn't even sleep six hours. <laughs> we, I was in Mayapur and there was this young American man who joined Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was a young Western man and he, he had become a devotee and he, he was really a nice man and he was dancing with great energy in the kirtan and everything. So somebody was talking that, oh, I, I, I don't get enough sleep sometimes and you know, we have to wake up so early, I don't get enough sleep. So I turned to him, I turned to this man and said, do, do, do you agree with that? He said, oh, I, always, I think we sleep too much in Krishna consciousness. He said, we, we get so many hours sleep. He said, before becoming a devotee, I hardly slept. You know, usually up late every night. And then you have to get up early in the morning to go to work or to go to class or something. You don't get much rest, but you don't mind because you're young and you go out and you stay up late and you watch, you do things so late in the night watching movies or something. And you don't think about not getting enough rest. You don't even worry about, but as soon as we become devotees, oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah. So, Actually, a lot of this is the mind. The mind is thinking, oh, I didn't get enough rest, I didn't get enough. 
But it, it's, the problem is just our mind. We have to just control the mind. We can manage very well. Anyway, eating and sleeping, mating and defending. These are the basic activities of the animal species. And in hu human life, we do want to control these activities. Control the activity, just like mating. Mating is meant for producing children. It is not meant for simply enjoyment. But it's a responsibility to produce good children. And defending. We want to defend what is actually necessary for our healthy life. We don't need more. We just simply want to have our basic needs. In the Ishopanishad, it talks about accepting your quota. Isavashyam idam sarvam yat kincha jagat yam jagat tena chaktena bunjitaha magridaha kashasitanam. This is the first mantra of the Upanishad and it says everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should accept therefore only those things which are necessary for oneself and one should, should not accept more knowing well to whom it belongs. So that's the idea, just not to be greedy, to always get more, but to be satisfied with whatever is given to us by our honest endeavor and to use whatever is given to us for the service of the Supreme Lord. So as living entities, we're meant to live together peacefully and cooperatively. We are not meant to fight and quarrel with each other. Sometimes it's very depressing to hear about the different conflicts which go on around the planet. One nation and another and one nation is threatening the other nation and sometimes even they go to war and they will destroy, try to destroy the nation. And so many people all have to pack up their bags and leave and immigrate, go to some other place. Just like in this year, because of the conflict in the Soviet, Soviet Union, something like seven million people immigrated. They all left their country and went to other countries. So they have to start their life again. So it's a great disturbance, that kind of thing. We want to live together peacefully. And we want to recognize the purpose of life. Purpose of life. That why are we here? Our, our purpose is not just simply to solve the economic problem. Of course, economic problems are there. We cannot deny that. But that is not the only duty in life. It's not that our life is successful just because we have solved the economic problems. Our real business in life is to understand more about our identity and to understand how we are all spiritual beings. And we have taken birth in this human body. Having a human form of life, it gives us the intelligence to inquire and to understand things. That opportunity is not there in other species of life. That is unique to the human form of life. And scriptures like Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, these kind of books, they're meant for the human beings. The animals cannot read these kind of things. 
These scriptures, Bhagavad Gita, was spoken for people, not for the, the dogs, not for the cows or the horse, but for the people, because people have brain, they have intelligence, they can understand these things. So Lord Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita some 5,000 years ago. He explained Ishwara and he explained also about the living entity, the Jiva, Jiva Atma. Now living entities, we should understand, we are also energy of the Supreme. But our problem is that we are thinking that this inferior energy is simply for us to enjoy. The material nature is described in Bhagavad Gita made up of eight elements. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego. So these are the eight elements of the material nature. But then Lord Krishna explains in the next sloka of the Bhagavad Gita that besides this, there is another energy of mind which are all living entities who are trying to exploit the material energy. They're, and because they're trying to exploit the material energy, they're struggling very hard with their six senses. Six senses means the five senses and the mind. So coming into this material world, we are the superior energy of Lord Krishna. We are superior to dull matter. We can take the energy, the elements of the material world and we can use them. We can shape them, just like from the tree, wood has been cut. And from this wood, they have created this thing, this trolley, this book stand. And so many other different objects are all created. This building has been built with so many elements which have been all taken from the resources of the planet. And in course of time, they will all deteriorate. The building is not eternal. The camera is not going to be eternal. It's not going to remain working forever. Everything has a limited lifespan because it is made with material elements. And similarly also our body is of that nature. Our body also is of material nature. That it, it, we cannot expect it will remain forever. Of course, while we have it, we have to make the best use of it. We say, make the best of a bad bargain. Just like sometimes you go to the, maybe, I don't know here in Malaysia, but in places like uh, maybe Bangkok, they have night market. You go in the night market and you, and you, oh, this is a bargain. Whoa, very cheap, this is a bargain. And you think you're getting a bargain. But when you take it, after you purchase it, and the next day, the whole thing falls apart. You know, it, useless. It was just a copy. Just a fake. Anyway, you bought it. So you, you think, I have to use it. Try to use it anyway. <laughs> One of the devotees came. And we went to, the, there's this huge big market they have on the Sunday there in Bangkok. So the devotee saw this bag and it had a, you know, a very famous brand name on it. And he thought, wow, wow, this, wow it's so cheap, you know. So he bought it, and then next morning the whole thing just fell to pieces, you know. And so, you know, sometimes you get these kind of, you think it's a bargain, 
But <laughs> anyway, the human body is like that. Our human body thought, we're thinking, a bargain, I will have this body, we can use it. But it's so problematic. So many issues come with this body. So many problems. The health problems, the mind problems, all the, all the problems which are there with this human body. But somehow we have to make the best use of it. Use it to get a better body. Not to, uh, actually when we say better body is to get free of these bodies and get, maybe get a spiritual body to enter, to get liberation from this world and to get a spiritual body. That's the ultimate goal. But at least you can get a better body, a better opportunity than the chance we've got now. Just simply by doing some service, some active service on behalf of Lord Krishna. You render some service. You try to do some humble service on behalf of Lord Krishna and that little amount of service which we do, that can save us from the greatest danger. The danger being that if we don't do something useful with this body, then in the next life, then you may become and you may get a body in the lower species. Lower species means you may become the dog, you may become the tree, you may become a fish or something like this. So we have to be very careful to do something useful with this human body. And the best thing which we can do with it is to use it for the service of the Supreme, to recognize that there is a Supreme Controller and that we are His servants. So we are the living entity. So Bhagavad Gita is describing Ishwara and then Jiva, the living entities. And then Bhagavad Gita also explains to us about karma. Karma meaning the reactions to our work. That we all have some karma. Karma is manifest in this body. The body which we have today is the result of our karma. Now someone has a healthy body, that's good karma. Somebody has a sick body, that's bad karma. Someone has a good economic situation, that's good karma. And somebody has a poor or a, a, a difficult economic situation, that's their bad karma. So like that, we all have some good karma and some bad karma. And according to the acts and the, 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 the work which we do, we get more karma. We're accumulating karma because we're all acting. Everyone is acting because the nature of the soul is to be active. We cannot stop activities just like we have to breathe. Even though you wear a mask over your mouth, you still have to breathe. And you may have to breathe in some bacteria and when you're walking, you have to walk. Sometimes there will be insects on the path. Sometimes you're driving your car or whatever vehicle you're driving. And you run, oh, you may run into a, an in, a, you may hit a bird with your car. Or you may run over something. Some dog or something may come and be run over by your car. Many things can happen like that. So we're getting karma. We get karma with our, all of our different activity, the food we eat. We get karma unless we offer food in sacrifice. Of course, the devotees know the art 
of getting free of karma. But ordinary people, non-devotees, they are caught in their karma with their karmic reactions. This knowledge of karma, this is there throughout the world in all different cultures. They will speak about these karmic reactions. And in the Christian Bible, they say, as you sow, so shall you reap. And in China, they will say, Zhong Do De Do, Zhong Gua De Gua. Or they will say, Shan Yo Shan Bao, E Yo E Bao. In Hindi, they will say, in India, in Hindi language, they will say, Jaisa Karega, Aisa Barega. Right? That's Hindi language. The, you get the reactions, they're going to come. You do like that, you get. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. So karmic activities are keeping us in this world. Just like you have a bank account, you have a bank balance. Now if you have money in the bank, then you can enjoy it. But if you're overdrawn, then it's a problem. So sim sometimes we have good karma, bad karma is like being overdrawn with the bank. You know, you're overdrawn, you owe the bank, the bank is going to come to you, when you're going to pay off this money, you're in debt, you've taken more money than you have in the bank, you have to pay back the bank. You know, so the same way, that's bad karma. You see, bad karma, the suffering is going to come. So we want to get free of karma. It's very important to understand about karma and how it works. It, you know, we can escape from the police, just like you may, you, you drive your car and you can go fast. And nobody, you know, oh, okay, here's the speed camera, slow down. Right? You slow down where the speed ca the camera is there, to, so you slow down. As soon as you get past the karma, then foot on the accelerator and you go again, you know? Go fast again. And, okay, nobody caught me. I didn't get any tickets. Didn't get any. But, in the eyes of Krishna, he sees everything. He knows everything everyone's doing. He knows who's doing what. And everyone is getting the reactions. Some good and some bad. Everyone. You cannot escape because everywhere are his agents. He's got his eyes everywhere. He knows everything about everyone. That is the nature of this world. You cannot escape the karma. But if you surrender to Krishna, if we take shelter of Krishna by performance of yoga, then you get free of all the reactions. And you get free of the reactions for all the past reactions. They're all removed. And even the desire, the subtle desires which are there, which force us to act, they can also be removed just simply by the practice of bhakti yoga. That is the power of bhakti yoga, that it takes away even the desire for sin. Not only does it take away the reactions, but it takes away even the desire for any sin. So the bhakti yoga is so powerful that it gives us that situation where we can be actually free of all reactions. So we say there are three phases of karma. There is vikarma. Vikarma means acts against religious principles. Vikarma means when you do things like take intoxication or eat non-vegetarian foodstuffs 
these kind of things, you get reactions, you get vikarmic react, heavy reactions come on when you do these kind of things. But when we do acts according to the scriptures, that is called karma. And with doing karma, acting according to the scriptures, then you, you can enjoy the material world you get good results. Because you did good, you get good results. You do bad things, you get bad, you get crushed, you know. But there is another phase called akarma. Akarma means no karma. Good karma will keep you in the material world. Even though you do good karma, you're very pious, you're very charitable, but you will stay in the material world. You're still in bondage. I mean, sometimes you do good, but sometimes you do bad also. Sometimes we're not able, we forget something. We're doing good, we're trying to do good, but then we forget and we fall into illusion and we do some wrong, you get some bad, or you make some mistakes and you get in trouble. Just like you make mis somebody may come and you may think, oh, he's a poor man, he's asking me for some charity, I should give him some charity. And you give some charity and the man takes your money and goes and buys drugs. And you gave him the money. And you say, well, I didn't know. But you gave him the money, you have to get the karma. You get the reaction. So you have to be very careful for these things. But, if you give them, put, put your money in the box here, no karma. <laughs> right? So, that is the secret. Devotional service. Lord Brahma said, Karmani nirdahati kintu cha bhakti bhajam govindam adipursham tamaham bhajamin By doing service for Lord Krishna, Govinda burns up to the roots all fruit of activities takes away all the karma and takes away even the subtle karma which is not yet manifest which may be there in the form of seeds so bhakti yoga is so powerful can free us from the cycle of karma so we said, there are five topics in the bhagavad-gita there's the ishwara there is the jiva, the living entity. There is karma. There is also time. Time is eternal. Right? Time is eternal. This world is manifest now. It will be destroyed. And after some time, after it's destroyed, then it will be created again. And in this way, time is going on continually. And, and the fifth aspect of Bhagavad Gita is Prakriti, or nature, the material nature, which we explained about. So we want to understand how we can make the best use of this body, which is Prakriti, and that is to use it to Simply surrender to Krishna and in this way get free of all karma. A karma, right? A spirit we can be relieved of all of the karmic reactions simply by chanting Hare Krishna and taking prasada. These simple activities very a very simple process, but very powerful. It can change our life for the benefit, for the better. All right, we'll stop and ask if there's any questions. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Sri Aparama. Um, Bhagavad Gita 15.15 says, Any comes, I'm situated.
instituted in everyone and in me comes remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness. Now is this forgetfulness a blessing? Why do we forget? If we forget, if we remember, then we will not do the same thing again after taking so many births. Is this forgetfulness a blessing? Is forgetfulness a blessing? Lord Krishna, as the super soul, performs functions mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita in the 15th chapter. Lord Krishna says, I am in the hearts of all living entities and from me comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So when Lord Krishna allows forgetfulness, is that a blessing on us? Yes. It's a blessing because it allows you to go and do your nonsense activities. And by doing your nonsense activities, then you can get rid of your karma. Gradually, because of, your, because of our karma, we desire to perform something stupid, some nonsense activity. So Krishna allows us to forget. No. Oh. Just like, oh, I don't want to chant Hare Krishna, I just want to go to party tonight, I will go to party. And, and so I will forget I am a devotee tonight, right? And so Krishna allows you to forget. And so you forget, you go there and you, and you of course you, you forget, you're a devotee. So you get, you do a lot of nonsense things and then you suffer. And then that way you understand that I better be more careful what I do in future. I have to be more careful, I have to remember. But Krishna allows us to forget because he sees our desire. That when we desire very strongly to forget, then Krishna, okay, just like, just like the father may tell the son, don't smoke cigarettes. It's not good, it's dirty, it's not healthy, you waste your money. And the son said, no, no, I want to smoke. But no, no, don't smoke, don't smoke. But the son is insisting, no, I want to smoke, I want to smoke. So finally, you know, the son grows up and he gets a job and he makes money and he starts to get cigarettes and smoke. What can the father do, you know, okay. Let him learn the hard way. We say, the school of hard knocks. We learn sometimes from the school of hard knocks. You, you know the school of hard knocks? <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's like sometimes the doorway is very low and you go through the doorway and sometimes you forget how low the door and you bump your head on the door and you go through the door and every time, somehow you keep forgetting that, oh, a bump, yeah. <laughs> you bump your head on the door, you forget. And so you keep bumping your head and eventually you learn, you know, I have to be very careful when I go through this door. I don't want to keep bumping my head. And so that's learning the hard way. So sometimes we have to learn things the hard way. Just like you hear, you hear, it's wrong to steal. Now somebody thinks, well, I can steal, I'm not going to get caught. But he gets caught. And he, the thief is caught and he's put in prison. And after he's being in prison, then he thinks, well, I'm not going to steal again. Because it wasn't very nice. I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm definitely not going to steal again. But sometimes, People are not so intelligent. They, they think, well, I got caught last time. I think I can get off with it this time. And they try again. And again they got caught. And again they go to prison for a longer time and suffer more. So they learn the hard way. But the intelligent person learns just by hearing. And he's told not to steal. He doesn't steal. So the same way, some people, Lord Krishna gives them knowledge. He helps them to remember. But for other people, 
They want to forget. And in order to enjoy or to think they're enjoying the material world, Lord Krishna allows them to forget. We forget that I'm not the body. We forget that I'm a spirit soul. And we're trying to enjoy the body. And so Lord Krishna facilitates that forgetfulness just to teach us. It's a blessing on us. The suffering which we undergo, just like, you know, teacher or the, the, the mother, she may punish the child to teach the child because she loves the child. So she may punish the child just to teach the child, to give instruction. So the same way Krishna, by allowing us to forget, he's letting us get punished in the material world to teach us and to bring us to the platform of knowledge. Hmm. Yes, Prabhu has a question. Hare Krishna to be in a legal line, is it seen to Defend someone who has done something against the law. Defend someone who has done something against the law. Yes, well, you can, you can try to defend them. You may feel you want to protect them. Somebody's a criminal, you may want to hide them. Maybe the police are looking for them and you want to help them and hide them. That's, but you will get karma for that. Of course, that's a material activity. You do something like that, you're going to get some reactions for it. If you do this, you may feel you're helping somebody, but the person has done something illegal, so he's in trouble. And so if you help him and hide him, you may also get in trouble. You may also, when the police come, they may also arrest you because you're hiding him or helping him. So you can also be put into trouble for doing something like that. And so people do things and we try to help them. So the best thing to do, help them is to give them proper knowledge to understand more about the nature of the material world and how to solve the problem of this material world. We want to teach everyone to chant Hare Krishna and to surrender to Krishna. And in that way then they will get free of their karma. People are doing things wrong because of their karma, because of their material desires. But when they become situated in knowledge, then they will act properly and they will not cause any trouble for anyone. Mm -hmm. You understand? Well, surrender is described in Srila Prabhupada's purport. He quotes from the Chaitanya Charitamrita how there are six items of surrender. First of all, we should accept whatever is favorable for devotional service, meaning hearing and chanting, associating with devotees, taking Krishna Prasadam, coming to the temple, these things, this, these are all favorable. 
and we should reject, we should give up all activities which are not favorable to devotional service. Meaning we should give up intoxication and gambling and meat eating and illicit connection with the other sex. And then we should, thirdly, we should understand that Krishna is our protector. When we're in any danger, we only think of Krishna. We don't go to any others, but we just think of Krishna. And Krishna is our maintainer. It's because of Krishna only that we're being maintained. It's not just simply by our hard work or by our intelligence or by somebody's generosity, but it's all by the grace of Krishna that we're maintained. And then fifth thing is to understand that we should have no desire other than Krishna's desire. And we should, finally, we should always be humble, meek and humble. So this is the meaning of surrender. These six items all make up the surrendered soul. We want to surrender, we take shelter of Krishna. We think of Krishna as our protector, as our maintainer, like that. So in proportion to our surrender, Krishna rewards accordingly. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, as you surrender unto me, I reward you accordingly. So surrender means using everything in the service of Krishna, just like our mind, we should remember Krishna. If we think more of Krishna, Krishna will think more of us. If you think of Krishna 10 minutes a day, Krishna will think of you 12 minutes a day. And if you think of Krishna 12 hours a day, Krishna will think of you 15 hours a day. So according, if, according to how we surrender, Krishna reciprocates. And Krishna says in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, that we should give up all of our material religion, give up all of our material concepts. For example, we come to God just to solve our material problems, our economic problems, or our health problems, whatever problems we have, we come to Him. But if we simply give up all of these concepts and just simply take shelter of Him, He said, I will free you from all reactions and you have nothing to fear. So by surrendering to Krishna, we can become fearless. In the material world, everyone is fearful. We're afraid. Oh, COVID. We're fearful of COVID. We're fearful of this pandemic. We're fearful. Oh, the, the ringgit is becoming weaker. Oh, we're fearful. Oh, my company is closing down. I may get paid off. I'll have no job. We're fearful. Or we're driving the car. We may be fearful. Oh, this is easy to crash. You know, like we live in fear, you know. But when we take shelter of Krishna, then we will be without fear. We will come to the higher consciousness. Understanding that we are spirit souls, we can become without fear, no fear. So that is the result of surrender, to transcend all fear. Yes? Trying to be a good devotee, but um, one thing which really bothers her 
it is the fact that um, whenever there's an injured animal, so she and her husband, they try their very best to provide for the animal and give them food and everything. So she had a doubt in her that um, because you mentioned that good karma will still bound us to this material world, so she was wondering how can she uh, approach that? Because some might say that um, I do not want to do it because uh, it will bound me with karma. So, but doesn't that make them selfish? Like they are selfish that they want to go back to market. When I understand the concept that, that um, going to the spiritual world is more important, <laughs> but um, doesn't that kill our mercy? That is the question. She says that we are already here and there is a hungry dog in front of me or injured dog. But um, if I stop myself from helping the dog in fear of incurring karma, does that make, I mean, doesn't that make me lose my mercy? Well, we have to understand you want to help the dog. We can help the dog in Krishna consciousness. You give the dog prasadam. Devotees, the, in the, uh, we, we read in our scriptures about one devotee. He, he was very kind to a dog. A dog was following him. He was going on a journey and the dog was following him. So he saw the dog was following him, so he, every day he would give the dog food and the dog would follow every day. So he make arrangements to give the dog prasadam. We're not against living entities getting Krishna consciousness. So we have food, we can distribute it to the birds as well as the dogs. We get we we want to share with everyone. It's not just for our own self. So when you give prasadam, there's no karma. If you give food which is not offered to God, then you will be karma. But if you the, give the food which is first offered to Krishna, then it becomes prasadam, and there's no karma. It's karma free. And so the dogs also benefit by eating prasadam. Just as devotees benefit, so do the dogs. So you want to give kindness to people, to dogs and creatures, give them prasadam and give them the holy name. Let the animals also hear the holy name. Lord Chaitanya was going through the forest in Jarakant. You know Jarakand? Jarakand is a far, big forest. Uh, there's a state there, Jarakand. Uh, when you go, it used to be Bihar, but they divided Bihar into two. One part is Jarakand and Bihar. So Bengal, Jarakand, Bihar. If you go to a place called Kanai Natsala, Kanai Natsala means the place where Krishna is dancing Rasa Lila. When Krishna leaves the Rasa dance in Vrindavan, when he disappears from Braja, he goes to Kanai Natsala. It's an amazing place. We have a wonderful temple there. Very beautiful, very amazing place, very sacred place on the bank of the Ganga. It was donated by us a Babaji and we managed to put a little temple there. But it's very wonderful place. Ganga is very wide, very, very wide there. And uh, so that's in Jarakant. In Jarakant, it's uh, a rural area. So Lord Chaitanya was going through Jarakant and he was chanting to the animals and ferocious animals like the tigers. And the deer, the deer is a gentle, the deer and the tiger, they were embracing. You know, usually the tiger would eat the deer, but Lord Chaitanya was chanting Hare Krishna, they became gentle. All the animals were dancing by Lord Chaitanya's potency in chanting the Maha Mantra. And the animals were all taking advantage of the holy name so you want to benefit 
the living entities, you want to be kind and charitable, give them the holy name. It's the greatest charity you can give. It's the greatest benefit. But you give some, you give money, you give some food which is not offered to Krishna, that's material. You want to give something, give the highest, give the greatest benefit, give Krishna. You understand? Thank you. Okay, so we will stop here tonight. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. His Holiness Sri Bhakti Vindavina Shanarishinha Maharaj Ki Jai.